Hi y'all, this is Krista Corbello coming at you from the Los Angeles area where I live and serve and where I was born in, um, but I'm actually from Louisiana. I was raised mostly in Lafayette for most of my life. I went to SDM and UL, met Father Sibley there, and was a part of the community, um, the young adult Catholic community there before moving out to California in 2020. And I'm excited to share with you a little bit um, from the perspective of women in the church, um, not just my perspective, but from my community as well, both here and in Louisiana. And I asked a bunch of women what, what we want you to know. What would they want future priests to know? So I know that y'all have read Letter to Women. This is a letter from women. So we just want you to know three things. Um, number one, we want you to know us in reality. John Paul II in Love and Responsibility talks about uh, loving a person is to love them in their totality in all of who they are and in reality. Um, so whenever you're learning about these things, the sexual difference and whatever Father Sibley is teaching you, um, it's that's a good start to know about us um, theologically and having a sophisticated theology on gender. Um, but to know woman and her nature and her gifts and her genius, that only begins with study. Um, it has to actualize in friendship and in community. Um, so what we're asking of you as women is to get to know us and know um, that's the only way that you can know the other parts of us, to, to know um, our motherhood and to know our roles um, in reference to your fatherhood and your roles. Um, you have to know us first. You have to know us in reality and totality. And that happens in friendship and that happens in community. Um, see this as an experience to, uh, an opportunity to experience God in colorful, magnanimous, and sometimes very ordinary ways. Um, to me, um, getting to know people, I'm fascinated with the human experience. I have um, studied psychology, and I think for me, getting to know people is to get to know the creator, learn the creation from the creator. And um, if you get to know us women, then you get to see a different side of the heart of the Father um, through our lives and through our testimony and through our experiences. Um, I want we want you to know <laughs> that we're not your opposite. I think when we talk about gender, um, and even historically, we talk about gender, um, one, as uniformity, two, as polarity, and three, in the most important way, and actually the way the church teaches, is through integral complementarity. Sometimes we think of complementarity as polarity, where um, you are my complement because we're opposite. You know, men can be intellect, women can be heart, and that's simply not true. There are things that are certainly uniquely feminine characteristics and qualities, um, and even virtues. But just because uh, receptivity is a quality of woman or um, a gift of woman, that doesn't mean that you as men don't need to be receptive. That's actually not exclusive to women. Um, you very much need to be re receptive. And I always think of in the Advent season when we're um, preparing for the birth of our Lord, like that's not just for women to reflect on in that season. It, men need to birth Christ in a new way in their own lives too um, at Christmas time, right? So and then we prepare for that in Advent. Um, so in the same way, we, we ask that you not be surprised by women sharing what might be seen as masculine virtue. Um, so protection, being protective, being courageous, these are not virtues exclusive to men. And there are women in the church who are bold and brave and assertive. And um, it seems contrary sometimes to what you consider a feminine characteristic or feminine virtue. But we want you to know when you know us, when you get to know women, that um, who we are, how we dress, how we think, us living out virtue, that's our feminine genius. And you'll get to know that when you get to know us. Um, and that kind of helps us move to our next point, um, which again is, is really based on the, the need for integral um, complementarity, right? Where we are two whole beings, like man, woman, two whole beings, um, analogous ways of being human, right? And polarity sometimes implies, like recognizes the sexual differences, but sometimes um, puts one above um, the other with power or, um, yeah, seeing one as better than the other. Um, but integral complementarity recognizes the se sexual difference, but um, knows that it's, it's, they're both needed um, in the church, in the world, in this context. Um, and there's lots of holy examples of that, um, of people living out their virtue and living out their mission even 
um, in holy complementarity in the lives of the saints. Um, saints were formed in clusters and in communities, and I, I firmly believe that uh, the church needs to um, allow more space for, fe for feminine leadership in the church. Um, and here's one example that I really, really liked reading more about whenever I was preparing for this, uh, was St. Margaret Mary and her visions of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Um, she was ridiculed for, for them, and uh, it was something that she couldn't understand that whole time. Um, but it was through her friendship and the brotherhood and even the fatherhood of her friend, St. Claude, no, actually her confessor, sorry, St. Claude de la Colombière, who is the reason, who his advocacy is the reason that we have that image and that devotion all over the world. Um, and there's, of course, other examples. We know St. Francis, St. Clair, and I would say even St. Edith Stein and John Paul II, the way that they spoke about um, phenomenology, like all of the saints, um, they came in clusters. So... Um, why would God not work the same way in our own lives today? Um, that there are people who are will be joint in your heart and your mission for the world, and they are a gift to you. Um, and some of those people will be women. And in the same way, we uh, have to receive you as um, our cler clergy um, to help us live out our mission. Um, so the first thing, we want you to know us. The second thing, we want you to know your brotherhood, your fatherhood, and the significance of that, as I was talking about with St. Margaret Mary and St. Cloud. Um, one thing that uh, I would really, really want us to say, and actually this is, I have a letter from women, like I said, uh, with the notes from all the things that my friends, both in Louisiana and um, here in California, who were, were saying similar things. So I can send that whole full document uh, to Father Sibley for you. Uh, where you may want to respond with logic, sometimes we need you to respond with empathy. And we're asking you sometimes to respond with empathy. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, women experience things that you will never experience, um, especially those who are mothers. Um, so I ask that you be gentle and loving and merciful and receptive. Like I said um, earlier, that boldness and uh, being co courageous is not a masculine virtue, neither is receptivity. Receptiv receptivity is not only a feminine virtue, I mean. Um, so we ask that you um, show the heart of the Father in that way sometimes. Uh, I worked in the pro-life movement for a long time at Louisiana Right to Life, and women sharing their testimonies about abortion and the abortions they've had and even people who are involved in abortion processes or, or abortion decision making. Um, a lot of times I saw women who were wounded by men in the church, uh, sometimes even told like, oh, oh, you're telling me about your abortion and they're coming to that, you know, their cleric, their priest, their pastor, very wounded about this abortion. And then they're met with shame and they're met, um, they're made to feel shameful for that decision and even told sometimes like just you know bury it down don't talk about this ever again oh you had more than one abortion don't talk about this um everyone's gonna you don't know what people are going to say about this so um whenever you are thinking in your own best interest or the interest of your church or the reputation or whatever and you're not responding to the woman in front of you um this is uh, not the way. This is not the way that we're asking you to respond in those difficult moments, in the difficult moments of life. Um, and that includes with pregnancy. Like there are there are things that you won't experience with pregnancy that um, I've never experienced even either, but um, many of my girlfriends have experienced like serious, painful and difficult moments, like even having um, a pregnancy that's what you would call crisis pregnancy, but not like just a teenage pregnancy. Like sometimes it's a crisis pregnancy because of some medical condition. Um, these are things that are that burden the hearts of, of women. And uh, we need our brothers and our fathers to be there for us, um, our community to be there for us in, in loving and merciful and kind, compassionate ways. Um, Brené Brown just came out with a book called Atlas of the Heart, which I love and highly recommend. And she talks about it's the need not just to listen, but to believe, um, and how that is such a part of, of being receptive. I, th I think that's a part of being receptive um, as a brother, as a father, to be receptive to women in that way. 
um, that even when it goes against your own logic, even when it goes against your own life experiences or the way that you would think or the way that you would feel um, to believe women when they say um, that their experiences were painful, to believe women when they say that they're experiencing something in the church or from another priest, even a brother priest of yours. Um, and I'm not saying that we you know, point fingers and, and point blame at priests, but we ask that you just have the capacity and even ask um, our Lord to open up your capacity to be able to be a larger vessel for the unique experiences that women have. So that is the second one, knowing your brotherhood, knowing your fatherhood. Um, the last thing that um, kind of piggybacks off of the last point is to know your roles to help us know ours. Um, so you are going to be a priest. You are going to give a Eucharistic gift of self, just as Jesus did. Um, when Jesus says, this is my body given for you, you're doing that. And no one understands that better than mothers, right? Mothers very much give a Eucharistic gift of their selves in pregnancy. And even when their child is an infant, if they are choosing to breastfeed, um, women understand uh, what it means to give so fully of themselves and so fully specifically of their bodies um, through their motherhood. But I want you to know too that women aren't um, exclusively mothers in that physical biological sense, that we have the capacity to nurture and care and love um, our brothers and our priests and, and you, men, um, in a motherly, maternal way even if we're not mothers. <laughs> so let us, we, whenever you know your role as, as brother, as father, um, and you can embrace our role as sister and mother, um, which we know that mother, motherhood is the most mature, um, I guess, level of being woman. Um, let us do that. Let us know our roles. And um, that includes being able to listen to us in certain circumstances. It's very good for men to seek out the counsel of wise and virtuous women in certain circumstances. There are crises in the church that maybe would be handled differently if women were consulted about them. Um, and again, that's it's a, it's a gift of our maternity to be able to sometimes see details that you would not otherwise see. Um, and that's not a better or worse thing. It's just... Um, a different thing. It's a complementarity thing that when we bring both man and woman to the table and let them discuss, and especially these kind of complicated circumstances that sometimes have a lot at stake, when women have a voice in those decision-making processes, um, they help and they want to help and they want to serve. Um, and that leadership, it doesn't have to look like, you know, um, maybe what we think of when we think of normal feminism or secular feminism. Um, which is kind of a big bad F word in the church and sometimes in the world. Um, sometimes we think of those uh, toxic forms of feminism, maybe those kind of perverse forms of feminism, which would be kind of antithetical to Jesus's, this is my body. That's kind of the anthem of the abortion rights movement, right? This is my body. Um, that is usually, and I, I believe, that is the result of men not living out their virtuous masculinity, um, whether that be their brothers and their fathers um, or just other men, men they've dated, maybe men they even married. And sometimes and oftentimes it's even men in the church who are supposed to be living examples of Christ. Um, women who choose those toxic forms of feminism um, probably do that in a, a way to feel uh, a unity and um, a community and it's a, it's sometimes like a way to safeguard what feels unsafe to them so the the like significance and importance of your gentle fatherhood uh, to women in the church especially women who and you're not going to know there's not a sign on you on their head that says you know survivor of rape or um, someone who had an abortion a post-abortive parent so the necessity for your love and your mercy and your kindness, um, even when you don't know, um, that that draws out our virtue. When you live out virtue, it can draw out virtue, and, and it's vice versa. And vice versa, where uh, men living out virtue, men living out their vocation, helps women live out their vocation. 
us women living our vocations, not just the religious vocations and spiritual motherhood in that way, but just even as a lay woman in the church, that our vocations can amplify yours. Um, so let us have those places because um, our, our stories, our lives, our testimonies lived out in virtue um, are just as much a testament to the gospel as your sacri sacrificial gift in your vocation. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you for getting to know women. Thank you for knowing your brotherhood and your fatherhood. And thank you for knowing not just your brotherhood and your fatherhood, but your role in the church as a leader. Um, we're not asking that we make decisions for you. We're just asking that you let us lead in our own way, right? We don't have to toughen up to be leaders. And that's sometimes things that women are told that you just need to toughen up. You need to let it go. And sometimes that's true because we get too caught up in things. I have had men who love me to tell me like, you know, you need to detach from this or, you know, don't feel guilty to take time off of work. Or, you know, when I was a teacher, you can't, you can't save every kid. Or when I was in the pro-life movement, you can't save every baby. And sometimes you need that kind of paternity and um, love um, and a little bit of detachment uh, from a man <laughs> to tell you that. But sometimes we just need your compassion and your empathy. And that comes with virtue. And um, yeah, women are praying for you. We want you to know that women are praying for you. Um, we're your spiritual sisters and mothers, and it's not just the role of religious sisters to pray for you. It's our role to, um, to pray for you and, and advocate for you and step up in leadership. So thank you again for your time, for your open hearts and your open ears, and know that uh, we are united in prayer and we will see you. Um, we, I'm speaking on behalf of many of my uh, women community. We're, we're praying for you and we'll see you in the Eucharist.